I'm so excited about bringing your attention back to the book of First Peter. For every commentary that you read, you'll discover that authors approach the book of Peter from a different perspective. One of the most common themes, of course, is that Peter is writing to a persecuted group of Christians in the first century, which is true. But as I was reading through the book and I came to chapter 2, I was captivated by his terminology when he said that God is building a big house. Do you remember that in chapter 2 and verse number 4? Let me just remind you what it said. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, that is Christ, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual what? A spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So Peter says God is building a big spiritual house, a.k.a. the church. And he's using all of us as living stones at, in, the, in the structure of that church. But of course we know that he refers to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone of the big house that God is building. And we're on a commission with Jesus Christ to get his work done. But I want to change the focus a little bit today and remind you that the witness of God's big house, the church, will only rise as high as the health of the marriages represented in the church. And I want you to hear me this morning that if your faith does not enrich your marriage, it is bankrupt and broken. It is not biblical faith. Because when a man and woman in that church fall in love, get married, they are a metaphor for the love of God to the world. It's strategic that men and women understand how God wants them to behave when it comes to marriage. So the title of my message this morning is simply Strong Marriages in the House that God is Building because Peter is focusing upon uh, women in verses 1 through 6 and then men in verse number 7. The premise of this text is that marriage was made in heaven. Are you tracking with me? I haven't lost you yet, have I? Marriages are made in heaven. Now, I know that everyone in the church is not married, so this message may not be particularly applicable to your life right now in its practical form. But you will soon see that this has everything to do with not just women, but all believers in the church. Let me remind you again, I've said it though, that marriage is one of the prominent metaphors that God uses to demonstrate his love for the world. He says that we are his earthly bride. Jesus Christ is our heavenly bridegroom. So when you mess with marriage, listen to me, when you mess with marriage, you're messing with the plan of God. You're walking on eggshells, you're in big trouble, don't mess with God's plan. <laughs> now, it's easy to say that, isn't it? We're living in a day when there is probably an unprecedented attack upon marriage. Even when philosophers and scholars and theologians for all time have said that marriage and family is the building block of a healthy society. You actually, I think we are witnessing the imploding of modern society because of the disintegration of marriage. There has never been such an attack upon the image of marriage as God intended it to be. And we should be greatly alarmed. So I'm not as concerned about what's happening in the culture as I am in the church. And what statisticians tell us is that as many Christians are getting divorced as non-Christians. As many women are living in dissatisfying marriages in the church as they are outside of the church. As many men admit to ignorance of how to build a strong marriage in the church as outside of the church. Something is drastically wrong. God is the designer of marriage. God is the giver of marriage. It is the basic building block of a harmonious, healthy, strong society. So Satan is striking at the foundation of God's plan for the world. He could send, listen to me, he could send Western civilization into a period of demise, despair, and darkness that it has not known heretofore. 
Your children may grow up in a land that knows nothing of the freedom and the morality and the control and the authority that it was supposed to know because of the breakdown of marriage. It's all important. I hope you're hanging in there with me. It's an all-important topic. Next to your faith in Jesus Christ, this should be the first matter that concerns you. Not because you're married or not, but because you know that it is a strategic part of God's plan. It would be an act of disgrace in the face of God for you who are not married to sit here this morning and dismiss this message as not important to you. Because you need to be educated in God's truth and what he says about marriage so that you can speak up at the appropriate time. With all that said, come with me to my text this morning. It's in the book we've been studying. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, I want to read verses 1 through 6 as our text for this morning. Keep in mind as we come to this passage that our premise is marriage is made in heaven. So he begins in verse number one, and as always, let me remind you that the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you and I think about it. This is God's word. Let it speak for itself. Don't argue with it. Open your heart to receive the word of God as it is in truth. Verse number one, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Oh, that's going to be a hard one to deal with. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I find it interesting that he takes six verses to talk to the wives and one verse to the husband. I don't know that it implies anything other than I'll talk about it next week. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, establishes that a godly woman's first and most important career, topping even her marriage and her motherhood, is her relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't you miss it. That first word in verse number 1 is an all-important flag to remind us of what he's just been teaching us about. Let me remind you that if we go back a little further in the text, Peter begins by telling Christian citizens how they should comply with all human institutions. He talks to slaves who are now becoming believers in Jesus Christ along with their masters, and they were members of the same church, and he tells them to submit to their masters. In order to lay the foundation of his argument, he says, let me just remind you about the submission and surrender of Jesus Christ on your behalf to the Father's will. He chose not his own will, but the will of the Father so that he could please God. And so the word likewise in this text is extremely important. He's saying to every lady who professes to know Jesus Christ, Jesus should be your hero in the the way that he surrendered to the Father's will, the way that he submitted to God's plan, even when it cost him great agony in his life. He did no sin. When he was reviled, he did not revile again. But he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. You were straying like sheep, but you have returned to the bishop and overseer of your soul. Likewise, wives, he says. What is he doing? He's tying both ends of these arguments to each other. Ladies, when you want to know how it's done, look to Jesus. He should be your first and greatest career in all of life. It is not marriage. Young lady, if you're looking for a husband, good for you. But be patient and wait for the right one. I promise you, marriage will only be misery for you if you hurry and marry the wrong one. You wait for God's man for you, God's choice for you. 
But more than that, more than your desire to be married, look to the hand of Jesus as your master, as your Lord. Yield your heart to him and tell him that you belong to him and only to him. Remember that Peter said that when he was in agony of soul, he continued, Jesus continued entrusting himself to the one who would judge justly. So Jesus is our example. What did he do? He chose not his own will, but the will of his heavenly father. Jesus said, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. He showed us, even though he was a full member of the Trinity, he made himself subject to and submissive to the will of the Father, demonstrating to us how God wants us to live and how God wants us to work. I sure hope that you're listening, ladies, as I'm encouraging you this morning to make your first and most important career your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, if you do that, every other relationship in your life will take on a new light You'll be able to see that person or those people through the eyes of Jesus. God will give you a grace. God will give you a peace. God will give you a strength when you don't look to your husband or to your children and especially, for goodness sake, not to your career, but to Jesus. Jesus alone is your Lord and do what he tells you and you will find an immeasurable joy that you will never know apart from him. See, this is a core concept in Christianity, isn't it? Jesus said, whoever would come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself and follow me. What does it mean to take up your cross and deny yourself? It means to come to the place where Jesus was, where I say, my will no longer exists. It's no longer my choice. I have been crucified with Christ. I belong to Jesus. And if he is the strong God of the universe would demonstrate such sweet submission to the Father's heart and will, trusting Him every step of the way, then there can be no other formula for our spiritual lives, can there? It's a core concept of Christianity. You know why many people won't come to Jesus? They know full well that it means a surrender of their lives. And they like the party scene. They like their dirty sex. They like their addictions and drugs. They like their immoral relationships. They don't want to give that up. I've talked to numerous people that understand fully. Coming to Christ means that I must surrender my heart to him and begin living the life he commanded me to live. You see, it's a core concept in Christianity. This isn't just for the ladies. This is for everybody to understand what it means. That the passion of the Christian life is that we want to emulate Jesus. Now let me show you uh, some of the things that I think emerge from the text. Number one... Will you observe also in verse number one, likewise wives be subject to your own husbands. I want you to see the structure that supports a marriage made in heaven. Paul uses terminology that would be familiar in the first century, particularly in a military way. The word submission or subject there is a compound word which means to place under and to obey. It actually means to come under authority, to live under the authority of your husband. That's very important. You remember back in chapter 2, by the way, in verse number 13, it's the same concept that he used when he said, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. In the same way that a citizen honors the authority of government, a wife must honor the authority of her husband, listen to me, which has been granted to him by Christ as God's representative in the family and in the home. And if you aren't prepared to embrace that, you're denying a consistent and clear teaching of God's word. It's his plan for all of us to live under authority. The head of every man, Paul says, is Christ. Every man lives under the same authority that the woman ultimately lives under. Except that the man is the representative in the home of the authority of Christ to lead in the, in the will of God. This was revolutionary teaching in the first century because women were considered nothing more than a piece of property that a man could toss out simply for burning the toast at morning breakfast. And Peter, the Bible is raising the, attitude, the, the, the honor that, that society itself would ultimately give to women. So he's honoring women, but this text 
still means to submit to your own husbands. I have to admit to you, it scares me a little bit. Let me tell you why it scares me. Because I grew up in a place, in a small culture, in, 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 in an isolated village in New Brunswick, where men and women were in constant conflict. The men were abusive with their words and sometimes with their presence and their fists. But the women were equally combative and violent and angry. And so the image in my mind was all messed up. There was no order. There was only violence and chaos and subversive lying and deceit continually. Then I came and found out that God has a structure and order and a plan to keep us enjoying his blessing upon our lives. And that order is that the man is the head of his home, the head of his marriage. So I'm afraid of it being improperly applied. You need to understand my heart is not to bring women under servile subjection to their husbands. Not at all. I know that because one of my favorite passages in all of the New Testament goes like this. Listen carefully. Here's Paul writing in Galatians and he says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. He clearly is not saying that a woman is inferior. I could never say that because I've been living with a woman who is superior to me in every way. For 30 years I've been living with her. And I know that intellectually and spiritually and every other way, she is my superior. <laughs> but as God's appointed leader in the home, I am the head of that home. And I have sought to nurture my wife and encourage her gifts. And my goal has always been to help her understand the woman God made her to be. And how can I support you in that? How can I help you be what God has called you to be? I'm going off on a little tangent. But I well remember the battle I had with God when April and I met in a small Bible institute in New Brunswick. And uh, she was there because she believed God had called her to the mission field. And she wanted especially to work with children. And I remember struggling that I was taking a choice servant from God's work to be married. And I didn't want to do that unless God made it very clear that he... And we wrestled through the will of God. And we was in love. We were in love. But just because we were in love didn't mean we would defy the will of God. We went to a period of prayer. You say, oh, that sounds so spiritual. It's the way every Christian should live in every decision. Don't make your decisions till you've sought the Lord. So the woman is not inferior. And notice this carefully. It is directed to her own husband. It means that a woman is not under the authority of all men in every circumstance. You know that a man misunderstands it when he tries to push his authority in his home upon another woman. Man, get your hands off and keep your mouth shut. She is not under your authority if she is not your wife. I have the great privilege of sitting in boardrooms with godly women who are my equals in planning the work of the missionary service that I'm engaged in. And when, when the women sit at that table with other men, they are equals in every respect. They are not under my authority. They're not under the authority of the chairman, except for the sake of order in that meeting, of course, as everybody would be. But the text says a woman should give her submission to her husband, not to all men. I was taken in this passage with her, compati her compatibility with an unbelieving husband. Did you see that in the text? I was so refreshed and challenged by it. You know what he's saying? That a woman who has faith in Jesus Christ is strong enough to stay in a marriage where the man is not also a believer in Jesus Christ. That's Peter's advice. She certainly isn't inferior to her husband. She is in love with him and she is enjoying her friendship with him. And deep in her heart, she longs to see him come to faith in Jesus Christ. And this whole text was written to help women who live in that situation. 
And so I think it's pretty amazing to see the strength and compatibility of this woman with an unbelieving husband, which is to say that she ultimately has power over, uh, she has influence over the power of unbelief, doesn't she? She's, she has the power to win her husband uh, without saying a word. I can't wait to talk about that in a few moments. Uh, pastors are in a tough place in today's world because we stand between a culture that sees and hears teaching like this this morning as archaic. It would be fodder for, the, for the, some, some evening news program to be mocked. And believers are listening to that and coming with their attitudes about marriage who have not submitted themselves to God's plan for their home. And then they're coming and asking the church to bless unions that are not made in heaven, in God's will. And so on one hand, we have to help people who, we have to help people who are in crisis in their marriage, and there are lots of those, far more than there should be. People living in painful situations in their home. And yet we have to hold the standard of marriage up high because it is God's teaching. And the Bible says God hates divorce. You need to know, though, that God has not given a man a blank check to do whatever he pleases. And Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So if he asks you to do something that strikes at the relationship you have with Jesus, you politely say, No! No! Politely, in a meek and quiet spirit. <laughs> Don't shout like that. <laughs> that was just for emphasis in the sermon. <laughs> and to wake the two men in the back who are sleeping. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. My mom is in heaven now, 17 years of age after I left home. Um, was forced to leave home. I went back to my mama and said, Mama, why don't you please divorce this fathead? Get rid of him. He's violent, vicious. Why do you think you have to stay? Why do you think you have to stay with a man who would abuse you with his words or with his actions? You don't. You don't. So make it clear what I'm saying this morning, okay? You tracking with me, church family? This is heavy going, I know, but it's good stuff. It's biblical stuff. Let me show you, second of all, the substance that fuels a marriage made in heaven. And Peter especially focuses on the conduct of godly wives. And he says, because of your conduct, you will win your husband to Christ. And he highlights some characteristics of what a godly woman should look like in her life. It's interesting that in the third century, at the end of the third century, in 397, at the end of his life, Augustine wrote what is considered to be, by most Christians, the, the single most important autobiographical work that was ever written. Augustine of Hippo, that big, great church bishop, church doctor, is considered to have influenced Christianity in the West more than any other author claimed both by Roman Catholics and Calvinist Protestants as being the one who focused our attention on original sin and divine grace in a way that few others have. And he was writing his autobiography and he made an entry about his godly mother, Monica, who had incredible influence over his life. I didn't even know that his father ended up coming to Christ at the end of his life. His father's name was Patricia. Patricia, there we go, Patricia, I have to say it like the Latins would say it, I don't know. Listen to the story that he writes about his mother Monica. She surrendered her, excuse me, she served her husband as her own master and did all she could to win him for you. Speaking to him of you by her conduct by which you made her beautiful and at the end she gained him for you. So Augustine's father became a believer in Jesus Christ, not because his son was a great theologian, but because Monica, Augustine's mother and his wife, Patricia's wife, excuse me, husband, 
You know what I'm trying to say? Yes, thank you. You got it. Saw the godly conduct of his wife and was converted to Jesus Christ. He actually details three things about a woman's conduct. He says it needs to be respectful and pure. Most Bible teachers seem to agree that he's talking there about a reverence for God and a moral chastity, a moral purity. This is probably reminiscent of Proverbs 31 verse 30 that says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Don't forget that, lady. For all the makeup you wear, it will fade eventually. And the wrinkles will push their way through the makeup. And your beauty will fade. And your ability to charm others will no longer be as sweet and powerful as it used to be. But a woman who fears the Lord, she will be continually praised. And Peter says, a godly woman's attitude will be one of reverence for God and of moral purity. It's all supposed to be humble and modest. Did you see that in the text? He talks about the way that first century women, and not just first century but women, but women of all time, have a tendency to be absolutely obsessed with fashion in making themselves stand out ostentatiously. They fashion themselves so other people will notice them. And Peter says a godly woman doesn't want to be noticed for that particular reason. She will be noticed, but not because of her ostentatious dress. Obviously, don't you dare misinterpret this text as saying a woman can't braid her hair, a woman can't wear jewelry, a woman can't, uh, can't be fashionable. But it clearly does say that she should never use her fashion as a means of drawing attention to herself because that is violating the modest and humble attitude of a godly woman. I'm not sure I should tell you this story, but I think it fits. Because modesty seems to have gone the way of the ark in the church. When I became a Christian, I entered a sect of Christianity that was particularly strict to the point of telling us how we should dress, down to very fine details. And I look back now, and it's probably cruel to say, to use the word cult, it's probably cruel to use it, but it certainly would be a sect that did not engage and educate people in how to think about morality and modesty and humility in a proper way. It was more, it was more laced with, with fear and oppression over our lives. So we couldn't think for ourselves. For instance, uh, one day I showed up to school and my hair was a little long. It was touching my, the collar of, of my shirt and the pastor of the church called me out of line with a group of other boys and forced us to cut, cut it. I said, I can't. Have, I made 150 bucks a month from welfare because I was a ward of the province. I got a check for $150. I paid $80 to my renter and I paid $70 to the Christian school. And the rest of the month I had to live on faith. And he said, You either go get your hair cut or you can't come back into this school. I said, I don't have any money. He said, stand there in front of the rest of my student body. And he went and got a pair of scissors and began cutting my hair. I remember being absolutely humiliated by that event. I remember going to a conference where the girls were carefully instructed that no blouse could lie any more than two fingers below your clavicle bone. Isn't that weird? And your blouse had to cover your elbows. I've never thought of elbows as particularly sexy, but um, I don't know. I know it sounds absurd, but it's true. And the ladies all had to wear skirts that were below their knee, better still closer to the ground. I remember watching my wife and I pastoring one of these churches. And I was standing back in the corner and I watched the ladies huddling to examine April up and down to see what she was wearing. And I remember it dawning on me, something is grossly wrong. If that's Christianity, I don't want anything to do with it. And I became an orphan of the church for a little while because I don't want anything to do with that stupidity. But listen to me. As diabolical as that was, so is the immodesty I've seen even in this church. 
I've been shocked and saddened at times by the amount of flesh that some of you women parade around in the faces of this congregation defying a spirit of modesty. And I think God needs to rebuke you. And I think that you should see your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit and a sacred trust from God Almighty. And you want to use it with the greatest care, not to draw attention to yourself, but to spotlight the inner woman that Christ has made in his own image. That's the whole point of the text. Peter says when you dress immodestly, you are drawing attention away from the beauty that Christ has created in you. What is the beauty? It's the beauty of a meek and quiet spirit. <laughs> Some of you are saying, this is simply oppressive. But the fact of the matter is, everything the Bible prescribes is life-giving. And meekness is not weakness. In fact, the first and greatest military leader in the history of Israel is described in Numbers chapter 12 as being a man who is very meek above all men on the earth. That's meekness, not weakness. But then, of course, our very Savior, the Bible says, learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So he's simply saying to the women what he would say to the men. Develop that meek and quiet spirit that is... Invisible and beautiful in the eyes of God. You still track it with me, church family? Or have I lost my job? <laughs> wow. Good thing is I'm going on holidays after this Sunday. <laughs> I'm leaving Max to talk with you if you have any questions. Number three. <laughs> number three, verse five. I want you to see, I'm going to just skip over this lightly. The holiness that adorns marriages made in heaven. The holiness that adorns a marriage made in heaven. He says, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. You know what he's saying, don't you? That trendsetters for the women of the church is the godly women of the scripture who've gone before us, not the culture. I hope you're tracking with me. Yesterday was the date, uh, the anniversary of each day in the month which marks our anniversary that I write a love note to my sweetheart. I do it every 26th of every month. I have for a long time. I'm going to keep doing it till the day I die. But I always go out and either grab her a Starbucks or a, she likes dark chocolate. I'll buy a dark chocolate bar and usually buy myself a bigger bar. <laughs> and yesterday, I know she likes Canadian Living magazine, but it's way too expensive when you buy it on the stand. Who would ever pay for six bucks for a magazine? It was on sale for $2. <laughs> so I brought the magazine, the candy bar, and put it with my note. And I always put on my beautiful bride on the front and the date. And after she's done with the magazine, I started thumbing through it. The first 50 pages, I couldn't help but think to myself, women don't have a lick of a chance if they listen to the culture. It's all makeup and beauty and outward appearance. And you should treat your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, but don't get trapped by the culture. I do not understand the church's fascination with the culture. Why do we care what the culture thinks? Here's what the Word of God thinks. And if the Bible says it, we're going to do it, whether the culture spurns it or celebrates it. You, under, you need to track with the church family because some of you are caught in thinking that you are wiser than God's word. And you're not wiser than God's word. And God's, when God's word flies in the face of culture, we can still love the world. We can still love the people of the world. We're in it. I know all of that. We're in it, not of it. But we don't have to let the culture to set the standard for us. We let women of God who've gone before set the standard for us. See, the Bible, not culture, is our authority. Can I just remind you that a bad example is strong for sure? But according to Peter, a good example is stronger still. I got to thinking about this last night, and I realized that some of the bad examples I've known through my life have long since faded out of memory. But all of the good examples that challenge me to walk with Jesus Christ still shine in my mind as examples of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. See, Peter's saying, so much of the Bible is written his, as a historical record 
because God wants us to follow in the footsteps of how men and women lived before us so that we can put it into practice in our own lives. So Peter hearkens back to the godly women who've gone before in the Old Testament. The fourth and final point, watch this. I want you to see in verse number six, the courage that backs a marriage made in heaven. In verse number six, he takes his thought of looking to the women of the past one step further and he singles out a renowned woman of faith whose name is Sarah. What a great example. He's basically saying when a woman chooses to live in submission to Jesus Christ and as an expression of her submission to Jesus Christ, honor the authority of her husband as the head of her home, then she's walking in the footsteps of great heroes of the faith like Sarah. You become Sarah's daughter, in essence, is what he's telling us in the text. Why Sarah? Why Sarah? She's one of the most prominent women in all of the scriptures, isn't she? She's even listed in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, that says, By faith Sarah received power to conceive well after when she should have been able to, because she believed that he was faithful who had promised. What woman wouldn't want to walk in the footsteps of a gal like that, <clears throat> who now in her 80s, well beyond her childbearing years. Here's God Almighty make a promise to her husband and she laughs in her tent. God confronts her because of her laughter. He says, I know you laugh because you were afraid. But the biblical record is, having encountered the Lord, Sarah then surrendered to God's plan and honored Abraham as the one to whom the promise would be fulfilled. He's the example. See, Sarah was a strong enough woman to confront her husband. I want to just slip this in. And she did on several occasions. She put Abraham in his place and probably had other occasions when she needed to. And I'm not encouraging you ladies to nag your husband because this text says your conduct is more effective to win your husband than, than badgering him with your words, even about Christian words. But Sarah was strong enough to confront her husband when it was necessary. But she was wise enough to submit to him as the leader of the home. The Bible portrays Sarah as a real woman, struggling with the commandment of God to live into submission to her husband. You know how I know that? Because she took God's plan into her own hands. And she really messed God's plan up, didn't she? Because she said to Abraham, it's not happening. Let me cut. She came up with another plan. And she enacted that plan. And the world has suffered because of it ever since. It's a painful thing that she did, but she still held up as an example to, the, to godly women. Now what does he say about these courageous women? He says that they're like Sarah, they're full of good works, and they have gutsy composure. I think this is cool, a cool description of a woman in the text. Do not fear anything that is frightening. Ah, almost every commentary I read on that passage had a different view. I think he's just talking about the gutsy composure that a woman of God has when faced with frightening circumstances. Of course, I thought right away about, uh, about Rahab, who was going to comply with an espionage. She was an espionage agent, a secret agent helping Israel take over the city of Jericho, wasn't she? That took a lot of guts. And she did it in faith. And she remained composed and obedient to the Lord. I couldn't help but think about Esther. When, when, the, when the weight of the entire nation was riding on the shoulders of this godly queen to go in and ask for the people of Israel to be delivered from the plight that had been planned for them. She had a gutsy composure. I couldn't help but think about Hannah standing in the temple praying for that child that she would receive from the Lord named Samuel. She would not accept the barrenness of her womb, but she kept knocking on heaven's door, asking God to answer her prayer. She did it in great faith. I couldn't help but think about Mary. What gutsy composure Mary must have had. Of all women in the Bible, she was just a young woman, a very young woman that received news she would bear the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. and She would become the laughing stock of the community because she was pregnant before she was married. That took some strength, didn't it, for her to follow God. I thought about Lydia, the first convert in Europe 
who was also a renowned businesswoman. I couldn't help but think about Eunice and Lois, the grandmother and mother of Timothy, who lived in a mixed marriage. So my conclusion is simply this. It takes just one person to mess up a marriage. It takes two to make it work. A wife can mess up a marriage by stubbornness. Stubbornness that may be a result of fear or rebellion. I simply refuse to accept the authority of my husband as the representative of Christ in my home. Or a man can be responsible for the demise of his marriage simply by neglecting and refusing to take the responsibility God has given to him. We'll look at that the next time I'm back in the pulpit. But the formula for a marriage made in heaven is that both the husband and the wife must be in submission to Jesus Christ in all things in their lives. And God then will give you a marriage made in heaven. Let me pray for you. I am well aware, Lord, that I have ventured into some very sensitive territory I have done so in the confidence of knowing that this is your word. But I don't claim to interpret it perfectly. I'm just a man that, that holds the highest regard for your word and believes it's true and lives under its authority. And I pray that your people will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit writing this word upon their hearts. I bless you and praise you for the godly women of this church who make this place as bright and beautiful and influential as it is. I thank you for their loving touch in every area of this congregation, from the worship on the platform, in women's ministry, in teaching, in leadership, in children's ministry. Throughout this entire congregation, I thank you, Lord, that this church is measured by the beautiful hearts of godly women who are among us. And I pray that you would protect them I pray that their ears would fall deaf to to the pressure of a culture that is collapsing quickly. I pray that their hearts will be freed to enjoy your plan for their lives and not give a rip what the world says. But I pray that they will find great joy in developing the inner man, in dressing the inner woman that is in your sight very, very valuable. And God, I pray for the men in this room who've heard this sermon in any area where they need the guidance and help of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, for men who will be the leaders of their home and who will love their wives, who would never use their authority to harm anyone else, only to protect and serve and nurture. I pray, Lord, your blessing upon marriages. There are some falling apart, some on the verge of collapse and divorce. And I pray that someone would have heard your word today that will cause them to rethink their choice because you hate divorce. I pray, oh God, that you will give us marriages made in heaven that that, that are a witness for this church and for the grace of our God and the love of our God. It's been on my heart all week to pray for the children who've been devastated by divorce. I minister to them on a weekly basis. They're confused. They don't understand why mom and dad have done what they've done. And I pray that you would protect their tender, beautiful little hearts and give them a sense of safety in their walk with you. And may their minds be protected from blaming themselves. May they instead learn to trust you and to follow you all the days of their lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.